It's been nearly five months since former President Trump left office, but his influence over the Republican Party remains clear. Baseless claims of voter fraud in the 2020 election continue to persist among many GOP lawmakers. Now more Republicans are calling for a review of the results in their own states, some of which Mr. Trump won. For more, I want to bring in Doug High. He's the former communications director for the Republican National Committee. Doug, welcome. Thanks very much for being with us. Elaine, it's good to be with you. Thank you. So we have seen former President Trump weigh in with written statements from his office on events happening. We know that the former president is planning on getting back out on the campaign trail, so to speak. I think he's traveling to Ohio and then Texas later on this month. What are your thoughts, Doug, about President Trump's continued active influence on the Republican Party? Well, it's going to continue to lock the party down in a very Trumpian mode, um, or at least portions of the party that will be very vocal on it. And then the portions that know this is a bad idea, but will be quiet because they don't want to say anything um, to, to really upset the president or his core base because they don't want to lose in a primary. Uh, the first event that he did you know, just two weekends ago was uh, in Greenville, North Carolina. I'm from North Carolina. I've been to Greenville uh, a lot over the years in various campaigns. And you know, what we saw there is that the organizations in, in the Republican Party, your state parties, your county parties, you know, much less the national committee, they are with President Trump, lock, stock, and barrel every step of the way. It means for those candidates running um, in state or local elections, and then obviously the federal ones, they're going to be pro-Trump on some level, or they're going to have to be very, very um, lucky to, to really win in, the, in their primaries. The primaries are going to be very difficult uh, for any Republican who's not fully behind Donald Trump. Well, how do the former president's claims of election fraud shape these state-led efforts that we've been seeing to change voting laws? And what message does that then send to prospective voters? Well, it, it obviously sends, sends a wrong message. And I say that as a Republican, you know, as we see what's, what's going on in Pennsylvania and in Arizona. Um, these are not competently run processes because they're not being run by competent people. And they're looking for things that very simply do not exist. Um, what's interesting, and, and now I just don't think anybody really knows at this point what they hope to accomplish. Um, what we've typically seen is that these kinds of um, autopsies or recounts or further recounts um, are done very conveniently where Donald Trump lost, that they're trying to do these now where Donald Trump won. It's not clear what they hope to accomplish there. Well, let's go back to 2012. The RNC conducted a so-called autopsy, speaking of which, after Republicans lost to President Obama a second time. Now, this report called for more inclusion and expanding the GOP if they wanted to win future elections. Donald Trump seemingly ignored that and won anyhow. Doug, how do you reconcile those two things? Yeah, you know, I'm very familiar with that um, um, autopsy that the RNC did in, in 2012 you know, coming off of the Mitt Romney loss. And I would tell you, you know, at that time, um, after the 2012 loss, I worked for Eric Kanner, um, who lost in a primary, which, you know, is, is important in this context. But in those days after the 2012 mm -hmm. election, as he was calling member after member, um, what did you hear? What did you see in your districts? Overwhelmingly, if you had asked me on Friday, the week after the election, I would have told you that Republicans would move some kind of immigration reform, something especially for DREAMers, for young people who came here were brought by their parents. But every day that we moved past that, it stopped being a problem for a particular member of Congress, a Republican member of Congress. It became a national Republican problem, the Republican National Committee's problem, Mitt Romney's problem. And so the further we moved away from that election day, uh, the less likely we were to do anything. So six months afterwards, I was telling people, frankly, we're not going to be able to do anything. We're not going to be able to get the votes from Republicans to do so. And ultimately, what the autopsy did was it proposed a lot of policies that, frankly, I would agree with, but that the base of the Republican Party didn't support and didn't want to talk about. And that's very, that's very much what Donald Trump successfully exploited in 2015 and in the early months of 2016 to take over the Republican Party. Uh, running against Hillary Clinton turned out to be the perfect person for him then uh, to run against if he's running against the status quo. So let's talk about where things stand now. The January 6th riot at the Capitol continues to shape dialogue between Republicans and Democrats. Doug, do you think there's a need for more accountability for what happened on that day? More accountability and more details of exactly what happened, why it happened, and who pushed uh, in, in public ways and in private ways um, for that awful, awful 
uh, moment. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a few blocks away from the Capitol right now, Elaine, and on that day, I packed a bag and was ready to go to a friend's house out of town in case I needed to get out of town. And I was, you know, again, several blocks away, um, but it, it still caused that kind of, um, you know, emotion and, and real sense of, of uh, lack of security, you know, for me. So we need to get to the bottom of this because this wasn't, um, you know, a, a protest that went out of control that we saw happen so often um, in, in the previous summer. This was a, an attack on the core of our democracy. These were people who were obviously, um, you know, chanting to get the Speaker of the House, get the Vice President, um, who served, you know, as, as Donald Trump's Vice President, that were calling for very real violence and attacking the very core of our system, which is an open and transparent counting of votes. You know, um, in our final minute or so here, Doug, I wonder in your private conversations with Republicans, how much the specter of violence hangs over the decisions that they choose to make and the posture publicly that they choose to take on various issues. Is that something that is factoring into their decisions right now, this idea that we have already seen violence happen once? And there is always, as we have heard from law enforcement officials, the possibility that things could happen again. You know, I haven't heard much specifically of I didn't vote for impeachment or I didn't vote for a January 6th commission because I'm worried about violence. But clearly, when we know what happened at the baseball practice where Steve Scalise was so critically injured, when we see what happened to Gabby Giffords and then obviously on January 6th, you know, members have a real real right to be concerned um, of their own safety, that more needs to be done for their safety, whether that's here in Washington, D.C. or in their districts. What I have heard from members in the past couple of days in regards to January 6th was just how telling it was that the messaging from Vladimir Putin um, in Geneva this week really echoed uh, what a lot of the real mm -hmm. Trump acolytes are saying as well. And that from Republican members uh, is something that they're really astonished and, and saddened by. Clearly, our adversaries are looking to exploit whatever faults they can uh, find. Uh, Doug, hi for us. Doug, thank you very much. Thank you. Anytime.